We're in 2 Kings. Turn in your Bibles to 2 Kings, and we're going to be going through the overview of 2 Kings tonight. And 2 Kings, interesting book. Uh, it obviously uh, picks up where 1 Kings ends. That's a gimme. Uh, but interesting, 1 Kings and 2 Kings initially were one book. But when they wrote the Septuagint, what happened was they were keeping everything on scrolls, and it was too, it wasn't, the, the, the length of the chapters was too long for one scroll, so they divided it into two scrolls, thus it became First and Second Kings. Um, Second Kings begins with the reign of Ahaz, Ahaziah in 850 B.C., and the, the story follows Ahaziah, the northern tribes, their end in 722 B.C., it also follows, begins with the reign of Jehoshaphat, and the story follows the southern tribes to their end in, listen, 587 B.C. So we see it's a story of northern tribes, southern tribes. Why is that? Because since the time of Solomon's son, Israel was split in half, right? Israel was northern Israel, which was the ten tribes, and then, then the rest was southern Israel, which was Judah. So Judah now is half of the nation, and then northern Israel, the ten tribes, is the other half of the nation. And this follows it through the, the different kings, through second kings. Now, the second kings will tell a story about how to kill a nation, a nation that's founded uh, under God. And it's, it, in the way they kill the nation... And by the end of the second kings, then both northern Israel and southern Israel will be brought into captivity. Northern Israel brought into captivity by Assyria. Southern Israel brought into captivity by who? Uh, can you say Nebuchadnezzar? And who was that? What nation was that? Babylon. So Babylonian captivity for Judah, southern Israel, Assyrian captivity for northern Israel. We follow that as you go through second kings, as you read through second kings. Now, interesting. 11 kings of northern Israel over 130 years, 17 kings over Judah for the 260 years. Seven of Judah's kings were godly. Ten out of 17 of, of Judah's kings weren't godly, but seven of them were godly. Do you remember some of the names of the godly kings of Judah, southern Israel? Notice, too, almost all the kings from northern Israel were ungodly, idol worshipers. But seven of the kings of southern Israel were godly. And what's interesting with that is the, the kingdom uh, lasted, uh, instead of 130 years, it lasted 260 years, 130 years longer for southern Israel before they were brought into captivity. Why? Because they had seven godly kings. So the, the nation was extended for 130 years longer for southern Israel than northern Israel before captivity hit. Why? Because of their seven godly kings. God preserved southern Israel 130 years longer because of the godly kings. Let me give you some of the names of some of the godly kings. Jehoshaphat, Johash, Amaziah, Uzziah, Jotham, Hezekiah, and Josiah. Josiah, Josiah was only eight years old when he became king. Can you imagine becoming king of Israel when you're eight years old? But he was godly. He was godly. Uh, it was the godly practices of these godly kings and the revivals that took place during their reigns that preserved the nation of Judah for 135 years after the collapse of northern Israel. All in all, 2 Kings covers a period of 280 plus or minus years and records the collapse of two nations. Listen to what one commentator, his name was Baxter, says about this. He says, the main theme of 2 Kings is willful sin brings a woeful end. Sinning despite warning brings ruin without remedy. Inexcusable wrong brings inescapable wrath. Abused privilege incurs increased penalty. The deeper the guilt, the heavier the stroke. Correction may be resisted, but retribution cannot be evaded. All these thoughts crowd up in upon our minds when we read 2 Kings. As we see the battered, broken tribes of Israel dragged behind the chariots of heathens like Assyrians and Babylonians, Babylonians, we surely cannot fail to see what the central message of this book is, that, that willful sin brings a woeful end. Well, what about grace? Why didn't God just forgive them? Even though they gave way to the immorality, the idolatry of, of the uh, pagan nations. Why did God just forgive them? Hebrews 12, 6 tells us why. Those whom the Lord loves, what? He disciplines. And he scourges everyone's son whom he receives. And, he's, and, and you know you're one of God's kids if you get into immorality or idolatry or drifting away from God 
And God just disciplines you and spanks you <laughs> because he wants you back. He's not going to just let you stay in your sin. And that's why he, he, he does this with Babylon, Babylon and Assyria. Now, interesting, if you study the history of Israel, after their captivities at the end of 2 Kings, after that period of history of them being in captivity, you know what? We never see the nation of Israel ever go back to full-on idolatry. Ever. To this day. Jewish people are not going to be uh, worshiping um, the gods of Babylon or Ashtoreth or Molech. Or they're, they're not, they never go back to full-on idolatry, vain idols worship, because in Babylon they learned this is not as God's people what we're supposed to do. And for, for the nation, from, from then on, they never go back to full, full idolatry because they learn. And how they learn. How'd they learn? Discipline. Discipline. How do our kids learn, parents? Oh, they go out and play in the highway and you just let them play. No, they go out and play in the highway and they get a spanking, don't they? And then, then the discipline brings change. And so that's why, that's why God allows Babylonian captivity. That's why he allows Assyrian captivity because it was the discipline that was necessary to get Israel out of their behavior of idolatry, full-on idolatry. And we see that in 2 Kings. They go into full-on idolatry. Two verses to keep in mind as we study through 2 Kings. Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is what? But the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Wages of sin is death. Another verse, uh, Galatians 6, 7. Don't be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, he will what? Reap. There's consequences to sin. There's consequences to dis disobedience. There's consequences to uh, discipline. Now, it's not that God wants to crush you when you sin. God wants to reprove you and get you back on track. It's like the prodigal son, right? The prodigal son, after he wasted all his, all, the, all his father's early inheritance to him on wine, women, and song. After he hung out with prostitutes and was partying and everything else, where did he end up? He ended up, well, first of all, he ended up with the pigs, the last place a Jewish boy would want to be. He gets a job feeding pigs. And then all of a sudden, the scripture says, because of that discipline in his life of being broke and being with pigs, it says he came to his senses and he went home. That's the purpose of God's discipline in our lives, is to get us to come to our senses and go home. Go home to who? Our, our Father. Our Heavenly Father that loves us deeply and sincerely and sent his Son to die for us. That's the purpose of discipline, to get us to come to our senses <laughs> and go home. Interesting, uh, when I see people that are go off into full-on immorality or um, wrong living and bad lifestyles, I see craziness. I see a lack of a sound mind. I see that's just nuts. But then when I see people repent and come back to Christ and live for God, I see not only blessing, you know what I see? I see sanity. And you know, even if I wasn't going to heaven, you know what? Even if heaven wasn't part of the deal, I'd still live for Christ. Because it's still the best life here on earth. Craziness involves walking away from God. The Bible actually says in Peter, it says those that walk away from God and go back to the world in immorality, it's like a dog returning to his vomit. You ever see dogs do that? Well, they throw up and then they start eating their throw up. I know we just had dinner. Sorry. But have you ever, ever seen dogs do that? You go, what are you, crazy? You're eating, you're eating vomit, man. And I say the same thing with people that go back to immorality and to craziness of the world. What are you, crazy? You're going back to the vomit of the world? What is that, nuts? Come to your senses, man. Repent. Get right with God. Because otherwise it's craziness. And it is. It is. Reminds me of the man that was demon-possessed. That Jesus, after he got off the boat, saw, and the guy was so crazy because of the demons he had, he was cutting himself with rocks. He was naked. And anybody that walked past him, he'd attack. Like this. And then I could just, I want to see the video of all when I get to heaven because Jesus says, hey, disciples, let's go over here and minister to this guy. If I was Peter, James, or John, I'd say, you, you go, you go. We'll pray for you, Jesus. 
And he goes over there and he ministers to the guy. And the Bible says after Jesus got a hold of him and ministered to him and he opened his uh, uh, life to the ministry of Jesus, not only was he no longer demon-possessed, but he was clothed and in his right mind. Sanity returned because he was walking with God and he was set free by Jesus Christ. God has not given us a spirit of timidity or fear, but of power and love and discipline. And one version says, and a sound mind. Praise the Lord for that, huh? Enough craziness. Let's live for Christ. So we live with discipline, power, love, discipline, and a sound mind. That's part of the promise of walking with Jesus. It's wonderful. So why study 2 Kings? Well, 2 Kings continues the unbroken storyline of Israel. It's the whole storyline of the nation of Israel. 2 Kings will, well, it continues the storyline of the Old Testament of Israel. It, it record, records the downfall both of Israel, the northern tribes, and Judah, the southern tribes, which include the tribes of Benjamin. Uh, 2 Kings gives a backdrop back drop for the majority of the prophetic books. Interesting. You know, we study the major prophets and the minor prophets at the end of the Old Testament. Those major and minor prophets, most of them were around during the writing of 2 Kings. And it's that history of the prophets. Of the ten dated, eight of the prophets fit within the time frame of 2 Kings. Of the six undated, four clearly fit during the time period of 2 Kings. Now, a good understanding of 2 Kings will help, help give you a better understanding of the prophetic writings. And that's important, because I don't know about you, I read the mi major prophets, and especially the minor prophets I read sometimes, I get lost. But if you, if you go to 2 Kings and 1 Kings, and you read through that and study that history, the prophets make a lot more sense, because it's in the context of those prophets that the, the prophets wrote their books. Interesting. Now, there, the word prophet is used 30 times during 2 Kings. It's the era of 2 Kings. It's called the age of the prophets. Two kind of prophets. There's the speaking prophets, Elijah and Elisha, speaking prophets that spoke for God. But then there's also the writing prophets. A lot of those prophets at the end of the Old Testament were writing prophets. They wrote those books of the Old Testament. The role of the prophet, well, there's three roles, really. Tell the future. Another name for a prophet is what? Seer. Seer into what? Seer into the future. And so these prophets were trying to tell Israel the future. And many times they were, they were warning Israel, if you don't repent of your idolatry and immorality, here's what the future lays, and that's going to be destruction by four nations. So they were warning them about the future if there wasn't repentance. Also, prophet's role, second role, was to reveal God, to tell them about God but also the prophet's role was to remind them of the word of God. The phrase that was often used by prophets is, thus what? Saith the Lord. Thus saith the Lord. The job of the prophet was to speak for God and say this is God's word to God's people. It's to be prophetic. Prophetic. Um, there was actually a school of the prophets where, where Elijah trained, trained future prophets. We, see, we read about that in the, in the Kings also, is that he started a school of prophets. Uh, that's, where, that's where he raised up other prophets, kind of like the Bible college of the day. Now, a third reason to study 2 Kings is uh, it, it gives us the unbroken storyline of Israel. It gives us the backdrop drop for the prophetic books, but also it, it emphasizes the value of the Word of God. Again, thus saith the Lord is used 20 times in 2 Kings. 20 different times prophets say, thus saith the Lord, and then they give the word of God. Thus saith the Lord, and then they give the word of God. 20 different times. Now, oftentimes, over and over again, we see in 2 Kings, they give promises of God, and those promises of God would hold up against the circumstances of life because the word of God, the promises of the word of God would not fail. I'll give you a few examples of that. 2 Kings, if, you got, if, you're, uh, if you're in 2 Kings right now, say amen. Okay, let's look at it. Second Kings, turn your Bibles to Second Kings if you need to still. And let's look at some examples of promises of God in bad circumstances that they face. Second Kings chapter 2, verse 19 is the first example. Second Kings chapter 2, verse 19. Then the, then the men of the city said to Elisha, Behold, now the situation of the city is pleasant, is pleasant as my Lord sees, but the water is bad and the land is unfruitful. And he said, bring me a new jar, put salt in it. 
So they brought it to him. So he went out to the spring of the water and threw salt in it and said, Thus saith the Lord, there's the phrase, Thus saith the Lord, I have purified these waters. There shall not be from there death or unfruitfulness any longer. So the waters have been purified to this day according to the word of Elisha, which he spoke. So the problem, water source contaminated, solution, fill a bowl of salt, pour it, pour it into the, the salt in the source of water. And then 2 Kings 2.21 says, Thus saith the Lord, I have healed the water. And so the word of God fixed, fixed the circumstance of what they were facing with bitter poisoned water, basically. So it says in 2 Kings 2.22, actually, that the water remains healed to this day according to the word of Elisha, which he spoke. You know what? God's word has promises that will fix our circumstances. We see that over and over again throughout God's word. And one of the beautiful things about studying God's word is when life is tough and circumstances stink, you go back to God's word, you stand on God's word, and it helps you overcome the circumstances you face. How? Oh, I don't know how I'm going to pay my bills. Philippians 4.19, my God shall supply all my needs according to the riches of Christ Jesus. I don't know how I'm going to have the strength to deal with this situation I'm coming up on today. Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through what? Christ who strengthens me. You know, and over and over again, I don't know how I'm going to, I don't know how I'm going to deal with, you know, I'm not, this health situation I'm in. Well, uh, by his stripes, we are healed. Healing comes from Christ. And we stand on God's promises when we face circumstances. We see that over and over again in 2 Kings. Let's turn to 2 Kings 3, 9, 9 through 20. I'm not going to read the whole verses because we've got a lot of verses to go through tonight. But there was a battle in the desert. The problem was three kings traveled seven days into the desert. Pools of water dried up. The solution was call Elisha and a worship leader. In 2 Kings 3, 16 and 17 says, And he said, Thus, sa thus saith the Lord, another word from God, Make this valley full of trenches. And for thus, thus saith the Lord, you shall not see wind, nor shall you see rain, yet that, that, that valley shall be filled with water, so that you shall drink, both you and your cattle and your beasts. And so there, there, was, a, there was a drought, there was a lack of water, there was a, 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 a need for water. And so what they, the thus saith the Lord is God's going to fill these ditches. You just dig out these ditches and God's going to fill them with water. Result, 2 Kings 3.20, read it. If you're there, say amen. It happened in the morning about the time of the offering of the sacrifice that, behold, water came by the way of Edom, and the country was filled with what? Water. Thus saith the Lord. Circumstance. And God, God meets the need for water. Um, let's look at one more. 2 Kings 4, 42 to 44. Another uh, circumstance that needed to be met by God's word. 42 to 44. Now a man came from... I can't say that word. You could say it in your spirit, and I'll just pass it. Baal, Shalah, Shah, whatever. And brought the man of God bread of the first, first fruits, 20 loaves of barley, and fresh ears of grain in the sack. And he said, give them to the people that they may eat. And his attendant said, what will I, will, will I set before a hundred men? But he said, give them to the people that they may eat. For thus saith the Lord, they shall eat and have some left over. And so he set it before them, and they ate and had some left over according to the word of the Lord. So there's a multiplication of bread. It's, it's kind of a foreshadowing of what Jesus was going to do with the feeding of the 5,000. And so we see the problem, lack of food, the solution, uh, verse 43. It says that, that there's going to be a multiplication. He says, what shall I say before 100 men? Give to the people that they may eat. For thus says the Lord, they shall eat and have some left over. God's promise, I will meet the need. The result is, verse 44, he set before them, they ate, and they had some left over according to the word of the Lord. A couple other instances of this, you can look it up later if you want. 2 Kings 7 talks about a great famine. God's word is brought forth, the famine's met. Uh, chapter 19, Jerusalem's under siege, and uh, uh, the solution was call Isaiah, one of the prophets, and the promise of God's word, again, uh, uh, gives them victory. Now, that's an interesting story because it says uh, in 2 Kings 19, 35 to 37, Jerusalem's under siege. Let me read it to you. And it came up past, this is 2 Kings 19, 35 to 37, Jer Jerusalem's under attack. And it came to pass on a certain night, this is 2 Kings 19, 35 to 37, if you want to tr turn there, that the angel of the Lord went out and killed in the camp of the Assyrians 185,000 Assyrians. That's amazing. 
And when people arose early in the morning, there were the corpses all dead. So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed. I guess he would. One angel took out 185,000 of his men. It's crazy. And they departed and went away, returned home, and re- remained at Nineveh. Now it came to pass as he was worshiping in the temple of Nisharek, his god, whom his sons Adamelech and Sherezer struck down with the sword. They escaped in the land of Ar- Ararat. And then Esheradon, his son, reigned in his place. So let me tell you something here. There was, Jerusalem was about to get, be conquered by Assyrians. Isaiah comes on the scene and gives a thus saith the Lord, and God sends, sends one angel, and that one angel wipes out, again, how many Assyrians? I was talking to somebody about this. It might have been at men's breakfast or something. I don't remember exactly who it was. But we were talking about the power of angels. Can you imagine a, one angel wiping out 185,000 warriors, Assyrian warriors? And we were talking about the fact that when Jesus was about to go to the cross, uh, uh, Jesus told his disciples, he said this, I'm not, I'm not being forced to do this. If I wanted to, I could call, what did he say? Twelve legions of angels, right, to stop this thing. Now, a legion was 6,000 angels. Do the math. Twelve times 6,000, how many is that? 72,000 angels Jesus had like this. One angel kills 185,000 Assyrians. Can you imagine what 72,000 angels would do for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? Good thing I wasn't Jesus. When they were beating me and putting a thorn of crown of thorns on my head and make, tearing my clothes off and gambling for them and stuff, I'd say, well, forget about the 72,000. Let's just get that one that killed 185,000 Assyrians. And I would, I would wipe those soldiers off the face of the earth. But Jesus didn't do that. You know why? He loved us too much. And for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. He went all the way to this for you and me because he knew that if we didn't do this, we'd all be going to hell for the rest of eternity. Amen. That's, that's why Jesus didn't send for the angels that could have wiped all those Roman soldiers off the face of the map because he loved us too much not to do that. And the amazing thing about it was that torture he faced on the cross was a joy to him because he knew in that pain there'd be, a, there'd be a payment for our sin and we would have forgiveness instead of hell. That's how much God loves you. But God demonstrates his own love towards, towards us in that while we're yet sinners. Christ did what? Died for us. Amen. Amen? All right, so let's look, let's look at an outline real quick of 2 Kings. An outline for 2 Kings is a little difficult because the subject is two different kingdoms. What are the two different kingdoms? Northern what? And southern Israel. Northern Israel, 10 tribes. Southern Israel, again, Judah and uh, the, the tribe of Benjamin also. So, um, so let's break it up this way. Chapters 1 through 9, through the beginning of 19a or so, is the ministry of Elisha. Chapters 9b to 17 is the fall of Israel. And then chapters 18 to 25 is the fall of Judah. So first part is the ministry of Elijah. Second part is the fall of Israel. The third part is the fall of Judah. Now, let's start with the ministry of Elisha, chapters 1 through 9. We're first introduced to Elisha in 1 Kings 19. Now, this isn't Elijah. It's Elisha. Know the difference? Elijah was before Elisha. And Elisha was the, was the student, basically, of Elijah. Now, um, we're introduced to him in 1 Kings 19 where he hears a still, small voice, which is the voice of who? Of God. It's interesting. It says, after the earth, wind, and fire, God spoke to Elijah in a still, small voice. Earth, wind, and fire? <laughs> you remember earth, wind, and fire? <laughs> I think it was called the Commodores, wasn't it? I'm really dating myself here. Who was one of the original singers with Earth, Wind, and Fire? Do you remember? That's a trivia question for you tonight. Um, can you say Lionel Richie? Yeah, Lionel Richie started as one of the original singers. That's just a little you know, side thing you take home with you tonight, okay? It had nothing to do with the Bible. But Lionel Richie, good stuff. Good stuff. I like Lionel Richie. Anyways. So the ministry of Elisha, it begins with Earth, Wind, and Fire in a still, small voice. He was told uh, to anoint Elisha. So Elijah 
Elijah in 1 Kings 19 hears a still small voice, and then he was told in 1 Kings 19.16b, he was told to anoint Elisha as a prophet. Now later in 1 Kings 19.19, 19, we read of the decision of Elisha to follow the Lord. That's Elisha. And um, interesting too, um, we know about Elisha that he witnessed, he witnessed Elijah being taken home to heaven. And Elijah's mantle, the original Elijah who men mentored Elisha, is placed, it's, his mantle of ministry is placed on Elisha as a double portion from the Lord. You remember he asked for that. He said, the one thing I want, Elisha said, the one thing I want is I want the same power that Elijah had in a prophecy power, in power to do ministry. I want that same power, but I want a double. I want a double portion. Good decision on his part, because you know what? He did, we, we see he did over 18 incredible miracles, twice the amount of miracles that were recorded by Elijah in 1 Kings. He asked for a double portion. He did twice as many miracles. God answered that prayer. Interesting. He, Elisha begins his ministry as Israel's prophet, and his ministry, again, is marked by the miraculous. I'll give you some examples of the 18 miracles marked throughout the Old Testament by Elisha. He parts water, he heals water, he calls a bear, he provides water, jars of oil, sun for a barren woman. Uh, he provides actually, a, uh, 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 he raised the sun from the dead after he provided this barren woman a sun, then he raised that sun from the dead. Death in the pot, multiplied food, healed leper, leprosy on a servant, a floating ax, uncovers Syria's plans, opens eyes, foresees famines in, pronounces famine, prophesies uh, uh, to the king, and then a dead man raised. Um, some examples of his ministry and his, his uh, power was 2 Kings 4, 6 to 37, the Shumamite woman. She was barren. You remember the story? She was barren. And then God provides through Elisha a miracle where she has a son, but then the son becomes ill and dies. She seeks after Elisha, gives her heart to you give me this son and then you let him die. And so he does a miracle and he raises this, this widow's son from the dead in uh, 2 Kings chapter, chapter 4. It's a miracle story of him raising this, this son from the dead. Uh, another story was 2 Kings 5, 1 through 19. Naaman, the Syrian. You remember Naaman? What did Naaman get? What was, what was the disease he got? Leprosy. And he was a leader. And uh, he was a Syrian. And he heard that Elisha could help him. But he was told, here's, how, here's what Elisha said. If you want to get better, you want to get over your leprosy? Go in the river and bathe in the, bathe in the Jordan River. And he said, that's crazy. I got rivers where I'm from. Why would I just stay home and go in my river? And he said, I'm not going to do it. And then finally he was told, what, are you nuts? This is an opportunity to get healed. Why don't you do this? And he was talked into doing it, bays in the river, the Jordan River. And what happens to leprosy? Life, terminal disease, gone. And, and one of Elisha's main miracles in 2 Kings chapter 5. Um, another interesting uh, thing we see in 2 Kings chapter 13, 20 to 21, is Elisha's death. Elisha died and was buried in a tomb. And later, during a funeral, there was Moabites that were being attacked. And then it, it says that a body of a Moabite was put in Elisha's tomb. And after Elisha, dead Elisha in the tomb, put in the same tomb, this Moabite, and the Moabite was raised from the dead because of the power of Elisha's tomb. Now, interesting too, Elisha witnessed the taking home of his, of his mentor, Elijah. Now question, did Elijah die before Elisha? No, he's taken up. And it was taking up. There's a chariot fire, and then he was taken up, and he never died. And that's interesting to me because it's one of two instances in the Old Testament where someone was taken to heaven without death. It was his mentor, Elijah. Who is the other guy? Do you remember? Enoch. It says, Enoch walked with God, bam, and then he was not. Now, why would God have two instances of people not dying, just being taken up to heaven like that? Because it's an Old Testament picture that foreshadowed what's going to happen to us if we're alive at the rapture. The Bible says there's a rapture coming. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 to 18, it talks about it and says, we who are alive at the time of the rapture will be caught up in the clouds to be with the Lord in the air. And it's going to be a miraculous thing where all these Christians 
that are alive during, when the rapture happens, which I think could happen in our lifetime. I'm praying it does. Because I don't know about you, I'd rather get raptured than die. I'd rather get raptured than die, you know, in the next 20 years, to be honest with you. Because it's, it'd be just fun. Just <laughs> beam me up, Jesus, right? It's going to be crazy. Millions of Christians, bam, just like Enoch, just like Elijah. I'm going to be, bam, clothes will be left behind everything. We just, bam, go up to, in, the, in the sky to be with the Lord. It's going to happen. And two times it happens in the Old Testament. It happens with Elijah, Elisha's mentor, and it happens with Enoch. Walk with God and was not. And what's interesting, too, is they never found, uh, someone else said down here, Moses possibly, too, because they never really determined where Moses died or what happened. It was kind of a mystery with him, too. It's possible that might be another instance of someone just taken home because they, they never, the death of Moses was very mysterious, too. But what also is interesting is when Jesus was transfigured on that Mount of Transfiguration, and Peter was sleeping, and then he woke up. Who did Peter see? Moses and Elijah in their physical state. And so physically, maybe they're brought home in a supernatural way, physically sent back to be with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. Interesting stuff. Okay, so section 2, chapters 9 through 17, talks about the fall of Israel. And it tells briefly the stories of 12 kings of Israel and 9 kings of Judah during these chapters. All their stories lead to the fall of Israel, recorded in chapter, chapter 17, the fall of Israel. Now, 1 Kings 17.17, 17, or 17.7, uh, Israel uh, says sinned against the Lord. And their sin is described. Okay, Let me give you some examples, and I'll just read through it. It'll be up on the screen. If, if you want to, you could turn to 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 7. And we'll start with that. Here's some of the specific sins that led to Israel's fall of, of the nation. 2 Kings 17.7 is they feared other gods. What does that mean? They started worshiping the gods, the pagan gods, instead of the true and the living God. Uh, chapter 1 actually said that they got involved with uh, uh, Beelzebub, which is a fly god. Why would anybody want to worship flies? They're worshiping a fly god. And that's just craziness. And you know what? You know what it points to, though? It points to the fact, as human beings, we're created to worship. And if you don't worship the true and the living God, you're going to worship something. And if you doubt me on that, talk to anybody that doesn't worship the true and the living God, and you'll find they're passionate about something. And what they're passionate about, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. In a sense, what they're doing is they're worshiping that. Might be a bottle, might be a drug, might be pleasure, might be success, might be money. We're all going to worship something because we, we have this hole in our heart that makes us empty and we're looking to fulfill that hole in the heart with something. Now, the only thing that's going to fill the hole fully is God, right? Amen? Amen? But, you know, we could try these other things, but the Bible says in the Old Testament they're empty cisterns. You know what cisterns were? They were wells. And wells would crack sometimes, and then the water wouldn't stay in the well, so empty cisterns. And when you go to anything besides the true and the living God to try to find full fulfillment of life, it's going to be an empty cistern. There's a leak in it, and you're never going to be fulfilled totally. And so they're going to fear other gods. That's the first sin that led to their fall. Second sin is they walked in the statutes of other nations. Um, 2 Kings 17, 8 talks about that. And it talks about that they walked in the customs of the nations whom the Lord had driven out before the sons of Israel and the customs of the kings of Israel, which they had first introduced. We call it in our time period of church here, we call it worldliness. They walked in the customs of the nation. But what does the Bible say as Christians, as people of God? Don't be conformed, Romans 12, 2. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. And you're going to bring judgment and discipline in your life if you become worldly and call yourself a person of God. And that's what Israel did. They conformed to the custom, the worldliness, rather than being what? Holy. And what does holy mean? Different. Set apart, we're a holy nation, a royal priesthood, a people for God's own possession. We're to be different. So when you walk in that room at work 
and someone gives you a hard time about, oh, that's Holy Joe, we can't swear anymore. That's Holy Joe, we can't tell these provocative, you know, sexual jokes anymore because Holy Joe is here. Say, yeah, you got it right, pal. <laughs> I, I, I am holy because God's called me to be holy. And if I'm stopping you from swearing and telling dirty jokes, praise the Lord. Because I'm supposed to be the salt of the earth. You know what salt was for in the first century? It was to keep things from getting rotten. And that's what, as Christians, we're supposed to do. Now, the problem is we have many Christians in our culture today that are worldly. And they're not being the salt of the earth. They're not being holy. And you know what? Those are Christians that are not having impact. Because you can't impact a world like be, if, by becoming like the world. And you know what, what part of the problem that we have in, in the world today with worldly Christians? The church is catering. Many churches are catering to worldliness. It's crazy. I thought, I, it blows my mind. I hear about churches playing secular, worldly, evil songs during their church services on Sunday. What you, talk about craziness, that's just insane. Not only is it insane, if I went to a church and they started playing an ACDC song, I'd feel like, this is the lamest thing I've ever been a part of, you know? What, what are they doing this for? That's not what church is for. They're playing ACDC songs, or, they're, or they're, 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 they're doing things that are worldly. That's wrong. And it's catering to, it's making worldly people feel comfortable in the church, and it's making compromise be acceptable, and we shouldn't go there. Amen? We ain't going to go there. As long as this bald-headed preacher's up here, we ain't going to do that. We're not going to be worldly in our church services. We're going to be holy. Because I want the glory of God to be here. I don't want worldliness to be here. I want to comfort the afflicted, but I want to afflict the comfortable. The worldly need to be convicted. They don't need to be comforted in their worldliness. And if we become worldly to reach worldly people, guess who's reaching who? The world's reaching the church rather than the church reaching the world. We're supposed to be reaching the world, not the church changing us to be worldly. And that's what's happening in Israel. They're becoming worldly. And they're uh, uh, going with the practices of the world and gets bringing God's discipline. 2 Kings 17.9 says also they had secret high places. Secret. Notice the word secret. Secret. And that brings God's discipline also. And we're not to be people of secrecy anymore as God's people. We're to be people of vulnerability, honesty, and trans transparency. That's a part of living in, in integrity, is being honest and not secret. 2 Kings 17, 12 says they served idols. The energies that they should have spent on the things of God were given to idols. Here's a question for you. Do you have idols? What are idols? Ultimately, what idols is, is anything that takes your heart more than God. Anything you're more passionate about than God becomes an idol. Question. Are there things you're more passionate about in your life than God? If there are, you need to repent of that. Jesus said to the church in Ephesus, I have this one thing against you. You've left your first love. Your first love should be God. He deserves it. He died for you. And we should love him with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, is what the Bible says. Actually, another thing that brought God's judgment too is 2 Kings 17, 13 to 16. They rejected the word of God. God sent prophets to call the people back to give, thus saith the Lord, some, and they didn't receive it. Message was clear, simple. Some of the greatest preachers ever, Isaiah, Jeremiah, great preachers, preachers that could preach, and they didn't listen to them. You want God's discipline in your life, just don't listen to God's word. You know, we're living in a country that's thick with God's word. We got a great radio station right now. If you're not listening to it, you're missing out, man. 107.9. We got great preaching on, we got some of the greatest preachers in the world are on our radio station. I believe that. And man, when I listen to it, it just, it, it floats my tank. I get, man, woo, like this, because God's word is just being proclaimed through our Calvary Chapel radio. But you know what? You can listen to God's word as much as you want. It's not going to make a difference if you don't obey it and don't listen to it and don't heed it. James put it this way, don't just be hearers of God's word, but be what? Live it, man. Live it. That's what wisdom is. Wisdom isn't just knowing God's word. Wisdom is living God's word. When you're living God's word, there's power in that, and there's witness in that, and there's blessing in that. But they rejected God's word. 
Uh, 2 Kings 17, 17 says they got to the point where they were actually putting their sons in the fire. They made their sons and their daughters pass through the fire. What does that mean? Human sacrifices. They got so worldly, they gave way to the incredibly wicked practice of human sacrifices. That's how lost God's people got, human sacrifices. And that's what happens when you reject God's world, become worldly, and you walk away from God, you start doing the crazy things that the world does, and human sacrifice is one of them. Now, let's look at one more section, we'll close. The last section is the fall of Judah. Judah is what, what part of Israel? Southern Israel. And, and they had an extra 130, 135 years longer than northern Israel because they had seven righteous, or I'm sorry, uh, yes, seven righteous kings that brought revival, that brought the word of God, and brought blessing and, and helped them go for longer than a century than northern Israel. Uh, we're introduced to the ministries of Isaiah, Jeremiah, Zephaniah, Daniel, and Ezekiel uh, during this time period. Their, their stories are, are told to explain further how to, ultimately, Judah is, the story is told also how to ruin a nation because of the wicked kings that they had too. And then they also have stories of how to preserve a nation because of the righteous kings that they had. Now some of the highlights in uh, Judah is uh, chapter 18 is Hezekiah's reforms. Hezekiah broke down and cut, cut down the false images, including the bronze serpent, serpent that Moses had made. Uh, they, they started actually worshiping that bronze serpent. He cut all that down and he got rid of the idolatry. Um, Hezekiah, also interesting, is given 15 extra years of life in 2 Kings. Now another interesting uh, guy that was a righteous king was Josiah. Uh, chapter 22, while remodeling the temple, what did they find when Josiah reigned? What did they find in the temple? Do you remember? The word of God. And, and the word of God, because of the idolatry and the immorality, the word of God got lost. And though Josiah, Josiah in, in remodeling the whole temple, they found the word of God again. And it was, uh, Josiah started reading the word of God, and he was so struck by the word of God, he started reading the word of God to all of God's people, and God's word came back into Israel. And there was revival. You know, one of the greatest ways you can have revival in your personal life, one of the greatest ways, ways, ways we can have a revival in our church life is getting back to the Word of God. Pastor Chuck, founder of Calvary Chapel, I had the privilege of going to a number of senior pastors' conferences in California when Pastor Chuck was still around. He's passed away now for the last couple of years. But I remember talking to him personally after one of the sessions, and I got one-on-one -on -one time with Pastor Chuck. I... I treasure that, that I actually got some one-on-one -on -one time with Pastor Chuck. Uh, someone's getting a call. You better answer or turn it off or I'll make you leave. <laughs> ushers, there's a phone call over here. Oh, problem, Wednesday night. We don't have ushers. So uh, I got some personal time with Pastor Chuck, and I asked him, I said, tell me about the revival uh, when Jesus' people uh, revival hit. What happened? And Pastor Chuck had like a 100-watt smile. This was in California after, in between sessions at one of the senior pastors' conference, and he said, it was glorious. He, he loved that word glory, and he just said, it was glorious. I can't, I can't do his voice. His voice was amazing. But uh, he said it was glorious. He said at one time, he said, we were seeing 900 teenagers, young people, hippies, baptized a month for three years. You imagine that? They'd have once a month on Saturdays, they'd have in this Marina Cove, they'd have uh, by Marina Del Rey, they, 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 they had a baptism. And whoever was getting saved, they'd say, okay, this is a Saturday. We're all going to, whoever's gotten saved recently, come out and get baptized. And they were baptizing 900 young people a month for three years. Do the math on that. It's amazing. I said, Pastor Chuck, what do you think, you know, fueled this revival? And he said, well, there was a number of things. It was the music was glorious. I mean, he said we were having music. This contemporary worship was evolving, and we were just hippies were writing songs like Seek Ye First. I don't know if you go that far back with Christian music, but remember that song, Seek Ye First? Seek Ye First was written at Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa by a hippie. And these songs were just evolving, and the worship was amazing. The spirit filled and glorious. So that was part of it. He said a part of it was just the love that was present. He said that we had all these homes everywhere, hippie homes, 
because they were homeless. They didn't have a place to stay, and they just we provided homes for them. And there was home leaders of the men's homes, the women's homes, stuff like that. And there was a community there, and that brought some of the revival. He said, but he said, I'm convinced the number one thing that brought revival was we were committed to God's word. And he said, we just studied God's word. And we got into God's word. And God's word was ultimately what brought the revival, he said, of the, of the whole Jesus people revival was because God's word. And you know what? Pastor Chuck was so concerned about all these hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of young people coming to Christ that his main Bible study was Sunday nights. And for years, he would do 10 chapters a night Bible study because he wanted these young people to get grounded in God's word. You think I'm long, long-winded? Some of those Bible studies would last up to three and a half hours on Sunday nights. And everybody have their Bible open and they'd be studying for three and a half hours, ten chapters. No wonder God blessed Calvary Chapel. Now there's 1,200 Calvary Chapels across the country and some of the biggest churches in this country are Calvary Chapels because it's based on God's word. And the revival that happened was based on God's word. Amen? Amen. All right. So, um, uh, also chapter 21, Manasseh and the cause and the collapse of Judah because of the idolatry, idolatry that Manasseh brought. That's another interesting uh, thing that kind of led to the collapse of Judah was the sin of Manasseh. Um, let's close with typology. Um, where is Christ in all of this, in the fall of Israel and the fall of Judah. Um, let's talk about that a little bit. Elisha's ministry, going back. Remember we talked about Elisha when he died. He was put in a tomb, right? And, th- and that tomb was a place where when the Moabites came, they threw in a dead body in that tomb. And then what happened? What happened to that dead body that was thrown in the tomb? It came back to life. Jesus' body, 1 Corinthians 15, it says Christ died for our sins according to the scripture. He was buried, but on the third day, what happened? He rose again. Just, just like Elijah's tomb, there's power there. There's power for resurrection. Now, in many ways, Elisha, in many ways, is a type of Christ. Um, uh, besides his tomb having power for resurrection, some other typology with Elisha, the prophet, is he was, his way... The way of Elisha was prepared by who? Who who prepared the way for Elisha's ministry? Elijah. Who prepares the way for Jesus' ministry? John the Baptist. Scripture says John the Baptist had the spirit of Elijah. And it also says in Malachi, the last chapter of Malachi, it says before Christ comes back again, Guess who's going to prepare his way for ministry? Elijah. Who prepared the ministry of Elisha? Elijah did. Who's going to prepare the ministry for Jesus when he comes back a second time? His name is Elijah. You could look that up later in Malachi, at the end of in the Malachi. Also, Elisha, his ministry was marked by what? We talked about already. 18 what? Miracles. Miracles. What was Jesus known for? Not just his, not just his teaching but his miracles. He healed, he healed uh, lepers. He healed uh, raising people from the dead. Very similar to Elisha. And then again, we talked about already, his death brought, brought forth life. The death of Elisha, when that Moabite was thrown in his tomb, it brought forth life. Jesus said, I'm the resurrection of life. And he who believes in me, even though he dies, shall live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. So it was a ministry of life, just like Elisha was a ministry of life. So even this story, this cha- these chapters of 2 Kings that point to the fall and collapse of these nations, of Judah and northern Israel, we still see, couched within this story of the struggles of these nations, we still see a character, Elisha, that points to Jesus Christ because the typology of his ministry points to Jesus. Isn't that cool? All right, well, let's pray. We've finished 2 Kings. Father, we just thank you so much for the example of, of these nations, Lord, that walked away from you, God. And Father, I pray, first of all, for our country, God. We are in a, a mess as a country. We need revival. We need one more awakening in this nation, God. We need one more turning back to you, God, uh, before you take us out of here. And I believe that, uh, 
good chance that we might see a rapture in this generation. But before that happens, I'm praying, Father, that you'll bring light and truth and revival back to this nation, God. Father, as our dollar bill is saying, God, we trust. Help us as a nation to get back to trusting in you, God, and seeking first your kingdom and your righteousness. And may we as a church be a city set on a hill. May we be a light in a dark world. May we be ambassadors for Christ that represent you well, Father. Please, God. And Father, I pray if there's things in our lives that we need to turn from because we've drifted from you, God, if there's passions that are stronger in our life than Jesus Christ, help us to get back to our first love, God. Work in our hearts even tonight, Lord, to say, come home, get right, and, and turn from those things, those idols or whatever we're dealing with, those sins. Uh, Father, help us to turn from those things we need to turn from and get right with you, Lord. Thank you, Father, so much for your grace. Thank you for your mercy, Lord. Thank you for your goodness, God. Thank you for your love. Thank you that you never give up on us, Lord. You give us second chances, tenth chances, hundredth chances, Lord, because of your grace. We thank you for that, Lord. Thank you, God, that you are a God who is rich, rich in mercy and grace and rich in love. Father, help us to be that kind of people. Help us to be gracious because we have a gracious God. Help us to be loving because we have a loving God. Help us to be kind because we have a kind God. And Father, help us to stay on the path you've ordained for us, Lord. A godly direction or godly decisions will lead to a godly direction. And a godly direction will lead to a godly destiny. And that's what we want, God. We want to be living in your destiny for each one of us. You have a future and a hope for us, Lord. You have a purpose. You have a plan. Help us to stay with that, Father. Help us to go in your direction so we can have that hope and future you desire for each one of us, Lord. Thank you for your word, Lord. Thank you that your word is what is going to bring revival. Your word is what's going to be living and active, sharper than a two-edged sword. Your word is going to keep us in that holy life you've called us to live in. And I thank you for that tonight, God. And we pray all these things now in Jesus' name. And all God's people said,